Everybody got time for that? All right, is your garden an oasis for pollinators? Uh, this was my picture that I had with lots of bees on a flower, but it is a bull thistle, which is an invasive uh, thistle and our uh, native thistles are really wonderful. And I hope to track some down someday. So we've got a central bee, a centralis, to another one probably. And then I think it, they were um, fervidus up there. This is up the hill from me toward Mission Ridge. If you plant just one native plant, it will make a difference. Um, any kind of planting or blooming flowers almost will help pollinators, but there's definitely better ones than others. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Our native plants evolved with our native insects. So they came together. They've, uh, when one changes, the other reacts. Um, uh, they aren't developed or they aren't evolved to work with plants that we bring in from Australia or China or New Zealand or something like that. So some of them work and some don't. Uh, I'll get into that some more. Building a new paradigm. Uh, I've also used this with the Rotary. They're, they're um, going to do pollinator gardens across the state and their projects have to be done in a year. So they particularly only have a little bit of time, perhaps limited finances. So if you haven't done this before, also you might wanna just start small. So it has a small B on a um, salvia dorii, I think. I cut it off so much I can't tell anymore. Just so you can think about this, since 2009, the United States has lost 33 million acres of native grassland. And I think that's more than the Amazon and trees. So the uh, World Wildlife Fund and Airwick back in the Midwest started this project to reseed a billion square feet and I just do it a foot at a time. And I like the one foot part, especially. So that's why I borrowed that from them. We can all have potted flowers. It doesn't take a lot of room to do that. This was one of my favorites that I ever did. And they got more and more into sedum and things that don't die. <laughs> the longer I've had pots, because I like to water them less and less. Uh, but when you're first starting out, this is a good small way to do it. And you can do this on an apartment. You can do this. Um, just in the corner of, if you rent, you can probably put a pot somewhere. Uh, petunias, grass, and hybrids aren't gonna give a lot of pollinators food. Probably those red tube flowers, I think they were sort of like tiny mice or something like that was their name. They may have been good for uh, hummingbirds, but that was early on and we didn't have a lot of hummingbirds and I didn't ever see one. Those purple petunias do smell wonderful, however. Hybrids and cultivars, a lot of them will have uh, many petals. They might not have pollen, they might not have nectar, or some of them might actually have more. You never know until you try one. Uh, they, uh, I can't remember her name. I think it was White did a test where they, and I think they did this down in Oregon. They've tested some plants to see which ones were more pollinator approved. But you can just go to a local store, make sure they have organic plants, neonicotinoids, can't say that word, neonics. Um, they put them on seeds sometimes and they put it in soil and the plants take it up and it goes right into the pollen and nectar. So it makes the bees sick. It makes them not be able to find home. It might kill them. So we want to avoid that at all costs. Uh, so I went down to Lowe's and wand wandered around to pick the plants that had the most bees on them sometimes. So Tina, I started with you, ha ha. <laughs> bees are generalists, specialists. We have oligolectic bees and uh, an oligolectic bee is one that goes to a particular plant and it might be a very tight relationship. Our, um, it's got a funny name. Andrina astragali, which sounds like it would be an astragalus bee is actually the death camas bee. And it's the only thing that can use death camas for food. And if there's no death camas, there will be no Andrina astragali. And possibly if there's no Andrina astragali, there won't be any death camas. Um, I don't know which of these bees are which, but a lot of the Melisodes, which is probably the one on the bottom right, like asters. And did you notice the one on the left? <laughs> I, was hoping, a, I was hoping you noticed. <laughs> it's not a bee. <laughs> Tina <laughs> found this amazing fly. So just really quick. Um, the fly antennae look like little, um, kind of like giant eyelashes. They don't have that elbow, the bend in them that bees do. And if you look at the bee right next to it, you can see it has a long, a long section and then a little round ball and then the rest of the 
antenna. So that's the scape is the long one that attaches to the head. The pedestal is like the little joint. And then the long ones that are all in a row are flagellomeres. And um, so they bend like an elbow a bit. Flies have two wings because they're in diptera, die for two and ter terra for wing. And they, a lot of times their eyes will meet at the top of their head. They have much bigger eyes than our bees generally. And their tongues kind of stick out. They can't fold them up like bees can. So you can see them and they do that hand washing thing. So those are the ways to tell when you've got a really tricky fly around. And surfing flies especially are really good pollinators too. Excuse me, Tina's Neighborhood Park. Uh, I'm gonna start with parks and work up to gardens. If you cannot plant for pollinators, you could volunteer to help keep a neighborhood park uh, growing more natives, help them keep the invasive weeds out, just go and take lots of pictures like Tina does. Um, you could give them money. There's lots of things you can do for a park. And this is really cool. I think that's a honeybee. It might be a colletted. Will? I don't know, but that um, is the harvester ant. I would guess. Uh, I mean, yeah. spider, excuse me. <laughs> it's, a, it's a leaf cutter bee. It is a leaf cutter bee. Oh, you can see the scope. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and, yeah, the, you and, can. and the bee yeah, made it. I have one of it flying away. No way. That's Good so ending. Cool. Good ending. <laughs> it, it made it. I, I was just amazed that the, the spider is it like grabbing it with its claw. It's so cool. It's <laughs> wonderful to see um, like the, the wild nature interactions in little, little tiny bits. Very cool. And then another demonstration garden that Chris shared with us. I really want to know what that plant on the left is. I have no idea what that is. Monardella is coyote and that's on the right. It grows. I saw it in the most amazing place. If you go to Park Lake um, by Sun Lakes in um, the middle of the state by the, um, the giant, ah, what's the name of it? The giant waterfall that doesn't have any water. Um, it grows in the talus. So the big uh, scree pile of basalt. And then there's these two foot, three foot circles growing right out of the rocks full of these little purple flowers. It's just wonderful. It's a tough little um, mint relation. There's a diadasia in the middle, uh, mixed to some in the bumblebee on the left. The one on the right, I think is flavifrons. Correct me, Will, if I'm wrong. And then Chris's bees on Campanula. So we already saw our black and gray leaf cutter. And there's a spelling, Tony, right there. Mega Kylie, Melanophea, however it said. Um, and these are bellflowers. And megachylid on the right, you can see the scopa. And I'm not sure about that little guy, not enough to go on there. Oh, and just a, um, a that, quick, yeah, yeah, on that, um, the one before. Yep. The one in the middle, um, I think you said diadasia, it's dialectus. You're right. That's what and, I mean. Yeah, Thank and you. yeah, no, I, I, I trip <laughs> over those two all the time. <laughs> I know the difference. That's funny. So that's a Lazioglossum bee. And when we call them diadasians, that's actually the subgenus. And there's a like bunch this. of them. <laughs> and they all look alike. And unless you want to pay for DNA, you're just going to call them diadasia like we do. Dialectus. <laughs> Dialectus. God, I can't say it right. Ah, sorry. Whoops. Back, back. Okay. So I just happened to be looking at the Abbey's Landing Natural History Reserve uh, photos today, and they have a Campanula bee. So this is a Duforia campanuli. So when you look at bellflowers from now on, see if you can find one of these little funny looking dark bees with these little short noses and hairy mandibles and funny little legs. They're, they're so cute and weird. Duforia have, um, I don't know if it's Duforia or Duforia. Um, they tend to be these, have these really weird um, tufts all over them and they're pretty small. I haven't found one yet. Lavender Asteraceae. Chris, do you want to pop in here with any comments? Apparently not. That's All right, the one on the left is yeah. a armored resin bee. Oh. Um, I forgot what the genus name is for that. Uh, it's a weird name. It's a subgenus. Um, anyway, that's what I know about that one. It's a new bee to me. You Sweet. can really see it's in the... Uh, 
It's in the Mega Kylie. Yes. Group, right. Mega you can see Kylie. that in its head. Um, and then the next one is another, I think still another um, of the uh, female uh, Melisodes. And then the one on the right is um, Celiox. Is that how you say it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's like, the, uh, cook I was just gonna say, I just heard, I found out how to remember that, like coelacanth. <laughs> Well, that was, that's, that's helpful for scientists here. See, Lacan, celiac is obviously. Yeah, obviously. It's, it's, that. <laughs> it's that. It's it's a cool one. A cuck, is, you, do you say cuckoo? Cuckoo? Cuckoo. 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 Like a cuckoo bird. Okay, good. They lay their, their eggs in other bees' nests so they don't have scopa. They don't collect pollen. They just go around slurping up nectar, I think. They might eat some pollen, but that, that kind has that really pointed tail to cut open other, I think, mega Kylie nests because they're leaf cutters, right? So they make the little cocoons with pieces of petal or leaf. And then that thing has to slice through that to get her egg inside. And then her baby will eat the other egg or the other larvae and grow up by eating I thought all the pollen. This was interesting at how I, I think I have three species of cuckoo bees that I observed there. That's a good sign of health, right? Exactly. Isn't that weird? Yeah. It's like a paradox. If you have yeah. parasitic bees, it's a good balanced ecosystem. And then the yeah. skipper down the middle. The little That's butterfly. the woodland skipper, yeah. yeah. Do you want to go back and do any of the other bees that you know? Uh, what, the On the other page? Yeah. Um, I think this um, I forgot what the, the bee on the right is, the bumblebee. On the right, I, on the mint, yeah, I think it's a flava fronds. Yeah, I think you're right. And um, I think we, I think I thought the one on the left was the um, uh, uh, fuzzy horn bee. What's the yeah, name? Mixed yeah. it. I have looked and I, and I don't know the name of that flower. I, I haven't looked That's it up. A weird one. It so is. fuzzy horn bees are supposed to have little um, hairs on their antennae. Will, mm -hmm. have you found them to be that way? I haven't been able to find very much. They're kind of like little bristles, but I haven't it's, seen anything. It's only on the males, and it's high magnification microscope. Okay, so not. Um, so I've I've bees. I've never seen one in a photograph. Yeah. But uh, I've you tried get them to under, take one. Yeah. yeah. You, you get them under you get them under a microscope. You can see it, but. I don't know what they were thinking when they picked that. As, I mean, I mean they're, they're definitely there. It, it, you know, yeah. if, if, you've, if you're looking at bees under a microscope, it's a useful character, but. I picked these yeah. flowers, these, these pictures more for the pretty bees on pretty flowers than for the diagnostics. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, we're, we're all learning how to do field marks as well as stuff under microscopes. So this is a microscope bee, nice and big, which you could blow up on your computer if you go to that website. And then, uh, We'll post this and all of those websites should work as links when it's done. Oh, one more, Chris. So do you know what the other non gallardia flower is? The ones on the left. It's kind of like a cone flower, but not exactly. Um, so I think that this is the same flower. It's just different maturity. Oh. That it opens up. So it's a um, hel um, Helenium, uh, Autumn Nolly. It's, okay. You know, so it's a favorite of the bees, and yeah. I think that one of them is earlier season, and um, so I think the one on the right is how it um, starts to mature and it's you know opening up part. Mm -hmm. Pretty sure. Okay, so I have to change my name. So you can tell the uh, Usura bees by their black antennae, and you can kind of see the little flying one. He's a bit out of focus, but he has a yellow clypus, clypeus. I think Link says clippus. I don't, I've never figured out how to say that. It's that word right there, C-L-Y-P-E-U-S. So Don has a rule about that. Uh, whoever says it first, we all follow them. <laughs> so we can begin with a planter. I, and um, this is my sister-in-law's house. She had a wedding last year. And so she really upped the planters to take to the wedding. And um, you can have one planter and you can have a lot of planters. You can have a water feature. So she's got a little hummingbird feature water. The water sort of bubbles up and flows over this other rock thing here. And she says the hummingbirds like sit there somehow and, and 
dip under this running water, which must be really fun to see. I have not seen it, but she also uses some height here, which is nice. And um, she's been planting native plants because she's heard me a lot, which is really fun. <laughs> and I have a water feature. We have a three story waterfall that I didn't put in here, but this little guy, when it was 108, I put water out for the, mostly the wasps, unfortunately, but just in case somebody was thirsty with some shiny rocks and it's now in the shade where it won't dry up every day the way it was. So that's just a bottom of a planter, uh, some agates that my parents collected out at the ocean. And then you just water it a bit too much. So the stuff washes out that's dirty or rinse, you know, dump it and rinse it, whatever you need to do to keep it clean. Whoop, 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 whoop. Sorry, go back. Um, really easy thing to do. I've seen them with marbles. I think I like the rocks better because the bees can get their feet into that a little better. Um, nothing to it, but I do have a lot of paper wasps and they actually like the mud in the waterfall best. So you do not have to have a native garden that looks like it's abnormal <laughs> from what the uh, stereotypical typical cottage garden is. Uh, that's sort of a paradigm that we are trying to break. Uh, these people have a perfectly good lawn and then they put this around the front by their sidewalk and it curves down to the left back toward the backyard. And most of these are native plants. So um, I wrote all the names down here. This is uh, Asclepius. This is a butterfly weed that's not native. Fireweed grows everywhere. It's uh, very quick to grow. It can take over. It has little seeds that float around like milkweed seeds and it also has rhizomes. Not hard to pull up. And um, like I had 12 feet of it. So I pulled it all up because I made it move down the hill. There's a um, shoot, Spirea. This has pink flowers normally, but right now it has really yellow leaves. So it's a cultivar. Uh, this willow tree is now green. I just drove down the street the other day and it's perfectly green. So when it comes out, it has white and then they turn pinkish and then they turn greenish. Willows are our earliest flowers for native bees, not dandelions as everybody likes to say. I think this might be Liatris, which is that prairie um, blazing star plant and then Gallardia. And I, I don't think that's coyote mint, but it might be. And then some yarrow and some other little daisy sort of things are, oh no, I, those are probably like a flea bane that's done, maybe hard to say. Whoops, I gotta quit touching things. Uh, this is just a fun idea. What if we tried a punk garden? And this particular person has just let everything go wild in their yard, which would be very punkish. It would not go down well with an HOA place. Um, so then there's a solution for that. Another funny name, a mullet garden, tidy in the front, party in the back, which means you can do whatever you want in your backyard where nobody can see, maybe, depend upon your yard. In Elise's yard, I like uh, what happened here. If you leave it, they may come. She was working on her PhD. She has two little girls, and um, I don't think she had time to do a lot of yard work. And she had aggregations of Anthophora and Andrina both. And we have two great stories that you can read. At least you want to say anything about your yard? We're sorry that you don't own it anymore. <laughs> oh no, yeah, I just, I did, I did nothing. <laughs> they were there. It was amazing. Let's hope there that there was the lots new, of, lots of bear dirt. The new people stick to the plan. I know, right? I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out a non-creepy way to like should I like buy them the bees in your backyard and send That's it to a great them? idea. Would that, would that be, would that be too stalkery? I don't know. No, buy them the book and then also put a little uh, bee habitat sign in your yard for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and that's a great way thing to do, by the way, if you have, you get a bee habitat sign, then you're telling people you're not just leaving the weeds and you're not just not thinking through what, I mean, you're not, uh, ignoring them and not thinking through things. You have a plan. Elise, why don't you thing. send them links to the blog posts? There you go. Oops. Yeah. So um, I've also run across a couple things when I was, I go off on tangents all the time as Elise can tell you, she has to drag me back. Uh, if half of American lawns were replaced with native plants, we could create the equivalent of 20 million acre national park. Nine times bigger than Yellowstone, a hundred times bigger than Shenandoah National Park. Doug Tallamy is, got, is a guy back east that does a lot of books that I have yet to read about um, natives and uh, re he restored his own 
10 acres. And he has started this thing called the Homegrown National Park and um, trying to make this happen, which is a cool idea. So just think about that. So Karen did that already. Karen, are you here? She has to unmute. So she had a big yard, looks like, with lots of grass. And Tina can pipe in here if she wants to. And then, voila. Looks like she's got a little bit of a border, so some lawn still, and then a lot of a little fence to kind of keep it organized is always good. She's got a um, ar arbor sort of a thing with some hummingbirds, and this is one of Tina's favorite places. Do you want to say anything, Tina? And these are the results. Oops. So she has what she said was a queen bombus on a red flowering current. She has a mason bee on another red flowering current. Uh, so this was in April and this is in May. There's still some flowers going. Uh, one of my favorite plants, it, all of mine have died. It does not like xeric dry, hot weather. Uh, it needs a little more water. Even when I watered it, it died. Um, bombus melanopygus on lupin. This is a Lava fronds, maybe it's a little hard to see because it's covered up by the flower down here uh, in a native honeysuckle. So we have native honeysuckles besides the Japanese honeysuckle that takes over all over the place. This is a checker mallow, Bombus mixtus, and a Melisodes on goldenrod just recently. Very cool. And Tina, I think, takes pictures there too. It's up in Mount Vernon where Bob lives. So Kate has a backyard that I helped water a little bit when she was in Tahoe. And it has yarrow and white clover, a few dandelions. Kate, is there some other stuff coming up in there? Were there violets or something? Seems like there were more things. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, lots of <laughs> Oh, English daisies. I wrote it right there where I'd remember. And I didn't remember. So she has yeah. uh, raised, raised beds, which got to go to seed because I didn't pick them because <laughs> I didn't get around to it. But there's, there's strawberries. There's some kale that's is that kale or something else? It's it's starting. Yeah, to there is out. kale. You let that go to seed. Yeah, it's a brassica, and bees love the brassica. It, it got to be about. Thanks for thanks for. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I meant to go pick them. I just never get there at the right time. Um. Anyway, that thing was like three or four feet tall by the time it got done. There's some mahonia back there, and she had chickens. It was a really cool yard. So just to talk about replacing lawns. Um, I have seen prunella and I know violets grew in my grandma's lawn, but I haven't seen a lot of that. We have native violets that ought to be able to do that. Um, Heather Holm said this about dandelions. They are not the first flowers, which apparently she, she argues with people about it. Uh, willows being the very earliest and some of her other ephemerals in the spring like trilliums and uh, spring beauties. So an early blooming native pussy willow, the pollen protein count is 40%. A dandelions is only 14%. And when people see lots of bees using their dandelions, maybe it's because that's the only thing in the area. So it's not because they like dandelions so much as that there's nothing else. So think about that. Um, and they only have, you know, three to six weeks. They don't live a long time to mate, collect all that pollen, lay their eggs. And um, Joe, maybe you can tell me they can make more than 12 babies in a year. Uh, Xylocopa can only lay six because their eggs are the largest eggs of insects anywhere. So we don't have a lot of those anyway. Um, so a couple of... So you're talking about to mason bees? Yeah, just how yeah. many so, the most. Um, a, a female, I find it... Um, so a blue orchard bee, Asma lignaria, which is probably the most talked about one. Um, they usually lay about 30 wow. eggs. So about four four tubes, excuse me, <clears throat> getting over a sickness. <laughs> My voice is a little weak. Yeah, so about wow, four tubes. that's amazing. They I live didn't know for that. about four or five weeks, yeah. We'll have to have you do the Mason talk again so we can record it. Yeah, be um, Northwest Meadowscapes is one of our local um, yard people, seed pr providers. These are, I think, a California native, so not from here. This is what they put in their, their seed mix. And I think it's $99 a pound, so it's not cheap. But you can look at this list and maybe pick up some 
one flower that you like and add it to your grass in all the holes if you want to do that. And this is another one. I don't know anything about either of these companies. PT Lawn Seed, I don't know what they cost. They had a whole different mix. And they kept talking about all of these things, but most of their pictures showed all of the English daisies and clover, not so much of the alyssum and the blue. Um, alyssum is really good for surfeit flies and surfeit flies are very good woolly aphid eaters. Um, Mike uses them in the orchards in Royal Slope to the, the alyssum feeds the, the, the grown-up flies. The grown-up flies lay eggs, the larvae eat the woolly aphids, and they help with an organic orchard so they don't have to spray for pests. So you might want that if you have woolly aphids. So this is my yard, a whole different ball game. Um, this is a, like a dirt road that goes up behind our house in case we need to go up the hill for some reason. I go to Derby Canyon Natives to get stuff. There's This is a lot of bot stuff. This is a boxwood, these are all thyme. That's a salvia, um, that's a lavender. This is a agastache, some lupin coming in from up there. So I have more pictures. Um, they talk about, they put yarrow, I put a, we have a meadow up here and I put, we put wildflowers in with the grass and yarrow was in there. There's not a lot of yarrow on my hillside, but I have a lot of it in my yard because we do water a little bit. We start in July usually. This year it was wet all spring, so I have probably tons of yarrow coming up now. Um, if you can't grow things in the shade, I have this plant in my front yard where it gets more uh, shade and more water. We water the front the most. And this is a wonderful little viney little plant. And the Derby Canyon natives guy, Ted Alloway, um, couldn't grow it up there where he was at, by uh, Peshastin near Leavenworth. But he came down and admired mine, so that was fun. I don't have any violets or piggyback plants. I think those are gonna grow where you guys are over on the other side of the mountains. But I've tried a lot of steppables and just whatever survives. So this I think is a speed well, that's one of those that intermixes. And I love it when they blend together and kind of come up through each other. And then they have sometimes different bloom times. So you'll have one and then the other will take over, which is lots of fun. Um, over there, especially, there are lots of heathers and uh, they bloom in the winter, amazingly. And I'm, I'm always amazed to see Melanopygus and Vaznesensky pictures from January or February, especially when they have those weird warm spots in the wrong seasons. They'll come out and forage for a little while and then go back to nesting or sleeping till it's time to raise their families. Um, keeping flowers blooming all the seasons is the best way to help them. So sometimes, uh, like right now, I don't have a lot of things in the front of my yard. So some annuals would be a good thing to put out there uh, to fill in the holes. Uh, lavender over here is a really good filler. So my bumblebees and the honeybees that migrate down to my yard like that a lot. And think up. Maybe you don't have a very big yard so you, or you have a neighborhood that doesn't allow you to do anything but grass you can have a flowering tree. And this is just a, a spectacular tree that was down in Eugene. Um, it's a big old Douglas fir. And this rose has climbed clear up to about 50 or 60 feet up into this thing. The, the trunk on it is pretty good size. It's at least, I don't know, three, four, five, six inches thick. And it was spectacular. We have a lot of native flowering trees, the ones that I have <laughs> in my yard. I have a Castera. I don't have a big maple. Jill can talk about those all day. Uh, Pacific dogwood, I don't have. It's too hot and we don't have any shade trees, but I have service berries. I don't have Western red buds, but I was happy to notice that there are Eastern red buds and Western red buds, so we can have our own. And this is a nomada. So it still looks like a wasp, but it's a little hairier. This one has lots of colors. And that is a cascara flower. I had no idea if it was flowering. I kept hearing and seeing buzzing. And so I went up there to investigate and it was a really good day because I had this great nomada. I had a citharis, which is the social parasite bumblebee. It was very exciting, but they were way up in the tree and very hard to get a good photograph of. So it was, I needed to have a ladder. Um, so, whoops, I've got these mixed up. This is, the grown up version of those trees. So this is, um, I'm, I'm talking, this is I think a service berry, a, a ponderosa pine, some bitter cherries that we cut down that kept coming back. There's another service berry and some mahonia. Um, this is an amar maple. 
uh, cascara is this one right there and this goofy looking thing and well maybe that one those are mah mahoganies curly mahoganies and these were um, Missouri primroses that had giant they have like four inch flowers my agapostumens live for those flowers and some of my leaf cutters will cut petals off of those and then this is purple sage which is a super dry plant it gets a little bit of water so it actually blooms quite a while it continues to keep blooming i'm sorry i'm recording this so shh. this is what it looked like before so here's before and after how much bigger it's gotten and we are, this year we cut all kinds of stuff so it's kind of ratty looking because we've been chopping things out making more room oops sorry whoops go back all right, so when we first planted those little Mahonias or these little baby guys, that's the curly mahogany. And I had some Agastache in there that didn't make it. Um, I put some grasses in just to fill in and those need to go away now. And this service berry, that elderberry and that service berry were um, here in the yard and we kept them. Uh, we built this berm up because we had wind going behind our house like crazy. So we made a big bump and then we put hedgy things in to make it slow down the wind. So that was the point of that more than anything. The mulch was there because we planted in July, which is a ridiculous time to plant over here, but we were having that um, WSU soil uh, people over. So um, we put mulch on it just to help keep it from totally drying out. It's still here. It doesn't rot on this side of the state. and. This is our backyard. There's that path. We have some rocks that go up. This is our meadow. That's all flax. And it blooms in this morning. And then by noon, it sort of just fizzles away and it looks all green. It's really interesting. Um, there's a bunch of gallardia in here. There's some, that's a, the same thing as this. This is a buckwheat. And buckwheats and a lot of these things don't like a lot of water. So um, we're seeing who's going to win. The idea was to plant things that didn't need a lot of water so we could travel. And I tried to name everything down there. And this is very green now. This is looking down our waterfall. There's a little puddle down here. And right there, that is a juvenile coyote that came to visit. And he was ch chasing the butterflies. It was so cute, but I had no way to get a good picture of it. This is Zoshneria, which is a southwest blooming hummingbird plant. So this is hummingbird alley here and they like to sit in the service berry and chase each other away. But that stuff is kind of thuggish. We, it gets too much water down in the Southwest. You just see one here and one there and the little bitty plants. And this is like this big bully. So I've pulled out a bunch of it right there. I'm taking it back. And this is thread needles coreopsis, which is a really cool plant, has little yellow flowers. And whoops, dang it, I keep touching things, I'm sorry. Anyway, we get lots of things I can't tell which direction I'm going, sorry. Lots of lizards, snakes, frogs, deer, rabbits, marmots, chipmunks, and a coyote pup. Uh, lots of things. And this is my favorite bird picture. We have tons of birds. Uh, we're surrounded by wild and I'm in the canyon that comes down from Mission Ridge. So the, the forest is up there, the river is down there and the birds go back and forth. So I see a lot of stuff. I'm in a really neat location. So I'm just lucky that way. There is a new pollinator garden in um, the Washington State Capitol. I think it was unveiled in July, June, June, I think that's right. I had some pictures and then I realized I didn't have any um, permission to use them. And so you can go to the zoo because I tried to contact them and their website makes that impossible, but you can go see the pictures of um, some of the ceremonies, mostly not the plants or just go to the Olympia and see it. They did have a kind of a ratty looking, um, pollinator <laughs> house that needs some work. Uh, this is probably a trap for parasites at this point. And these things are arrows for the veterans section. That, that was when we were there in January. No flowers at that point. Cascadia College, it's Colleen's turn to talk about and just tell me when to, oh, you don't know what the slides look like maybe. I don't, but that's okay. I can roll with this one. Um, so I worked at Cascadia College for a uh, year and change and um, they have a joint campus with UW Bothell and which is unique in and of itself, but uh, they work really hard. The sustainability departments work really hard to, to uh, maintain uh, uh, chemical free, you know, campus. So they do have a lot, of, they, they have registered, they are a B Campus USA. Um, they have um, 
won the Campus Sustainability Award for their food forest and also, oh yeah, herbicide free campus report. So they, they definitely work hard to protect their pollinators. Okay, and we have some pictures. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, this is from the Bee Research Initiative that on, on campus, the students will come out and study the relative abundance and, and um, wait, diversity of the bees. And you see a little bee right here. But um, this campus is really well supported by the grounds team. The grounds team is amazing. Uh, and they do a really good job of both keeping a lot of pollinator plants in there and um, while still making it look I don't know, pretty, you know, it, that's maybe the best word for it, but, um, and using UW colors, look at that, they got the, <laughs> uh, uh, so the, um, but one of the things that the research initiative was able to do was to identify where there were bloom, bloom gaps on campus, and then the um, grounds team would res respond by maybe planting more or planting things that bloom at different times. Awesome. I'm going to go one more and then we're going to go back probably. Just another picture. <laughs> and she gave me lots. Yeah, I just, I just threw a bunch of pictures out. Does anybody know what this thing is? Is that Leatris or is it something else? I don't know that flower. It looks minty. It may be, maybe um, a mint family. There's a Bombas Bosnicenski maybe. It's covered in pollen, hard to tell, and a little boy bee. That and pollen is not from that, that flower. It. That pollen is from oh, <laughs> that pollen is from um, a rose of Sharon. That is just to the left. Oh, of that. <laughs> okay. I want to go back to that's a pink mallow on the right. Um, um, someone right. mentioned penstemon. Is that it? Yeah. Would that be it? Oh, okay. That one. Oh, interesting. I don't know. Could be. And then back here, um, I heard a thing about asters because they always flop over. So if you cut them back around the late May to June time, then they branch out and they get a lot stiffer and then you don't have so much of that floppiness and then they're yeah. not laying on the ground all over the place. What I like about this too is how densely it's planted and it's in big swaths or groups. So the bees really like a big group they can see the yellow and they can just waddle around in this one area over and over mm. and over and over again. Um, and then if they're a purple bee, they can go from there to there to there. And that is an egg apostolate. Whoops. But Sorry. what I noticed when I was working with the <laughs> with this group um, is you would see very specific bees that were just in the yellow flowers. And then there was a different species that species in the purple flowers. And they didn't often cross you know they would they would kind of do it but they just were like these are my flowers and these are the ones i like right now yep. they have different length tongues and different yep. adaptations to how they can get the pollen so that they prefer certain things and um one ichi i thought they were trying to say wenatchee in a funny way in oregon and no it's like one of this and one of that one each plant one instead each. of instead of a big swath mm -hmm. so avoid the one ichiness which I thought was cute. Okay, and does anybody know what that one is? That's a really pretty plant. And I don't think it's goat's beard. It's something uh, that that's Culver's root, oh, which is okay. uh, native of the tall grass prairies of the Midwest. And then this is some sort of, is it an umbella form? Maybe I can't tell. And there's some white things in here. There's lots of plants. I need. I need. We need to go on a field trip. Unfortunately, right now is when it's probably the driest. It has the least. Yeah, we need to go when it's blooming, but yeah. um, chives and all of the thymes and lavender and all of, and Joe, were you the one or somebody else? Oh, it was Andoni was saying the rosemary blooms super early. They're good filler plants and they bloom for a long time often. So they're really good for uh, when the natives don't, don't fill in all the time. Uh, I want to get this lady, Donna Lucas, to come talk to us. Um, Lisa Hill, who was on the in the group last week or last month, and Jane Abel. There's three really good photographers down there. And Donna and Heather went made this wonderful plant guide. So if you have really dry areas like Joe with lots of gravel where you can grow east side plants on the west side of the state, or if you live on my side of the state, because I'm the only one that I know of in the group so far, uh, we got to work on that. Oops. Anyway, that's a good book. And let me go back. Uh, it's from the HGCD, which I think is their um, 
Plant Society, but you can go to the Washington Native Plant Society and get to it. And if they're out, then I just wrote Donna and she said there's lots, they just hadn't restocked it. So I got one, I think it was $35. You can look at mine, see if you want one. Uh, I just wanted to throw in a definition for a native plant that I like. Someone told me if it was 100 miles east or west, so if I live right about here somewhere, um, I can go 100 miles this way, 100 miles this way, which takes me up into the Cascades. So it's not really accurate where I live, and then 50 miles north or south. And it may be the other direction, I can't remember, but I think that's the right way. So, um, so my native plant ecoregion would be a kind of an oval around my land. And then Joe has a really dry outwash from the glacier. So he's down in somewhere in there. I don't know where tonight I know he is in there, mm -hmm. next to the you, rivers. I'm close. You're right. Yeah, it's in that kind of lighter green area Over south here. of the sound. Uh, no, down to your down. to the right. To the to right. The right. That okay. That you're, you're actually right on tonight or right there, the point Excellent. of your pointer. Yeah. And look at he doesn't have to go very far for, before he strays into whatever this purple stuff is. It looks and like the cascade, the really the tiny. Yeah. Okay, so um, David actually did this. He made these eco regions, and then he put bumblebees on top of each one. So if you go to the bumblebees.org, there's one at the very bottom of each bumblebee. So you have to find the part of the key where you get to the different bumblebees or just look when you get to bombus huntii it'll be over here mostly although a few of them are over there um and then flava fronds are like around the edges or occidentalis are up in the mountains um so you can see that, that there's connections between whatever is in that growing area and our bumblebees which probably works for our other bees too maybe we'll get there someday we have some really tough natives for uh, difficult locations. So just to throw that out, this was in um, Spokane. Is it Potentilla or Potentilla? I want to say it like a Spanish name. Uh, it tends to get a little ratty looking. So I think it needs to be kind of pruned back every once in a while to make it thicker. Uh, but it does survive in some really awful places. This is surrounded by blacktop. It was a narrow planting. It probably got decent water. It had maple trees in it, so they had to water, but uh, it was blooming for a long time. And then this is gravel with some of our uh, specialty plants over here that live up on the top of the basalt where it's like tundra and they're super short. And that's where the bitter root blooms. It's really cool to see. Um, but anyway, you can find things for each, each location. Uh, we did do a pollinator week uh, thing really quick uh, about hysop, which is related to agastiki. This is this is a cultivar. Uh, we do have a native one. We have beard tongue, which is the penstemons. This is a Chelan penstemon, which is a native. And if you're driving up the west side of the Columbia River, you could see it along the cliffs. And then the different nepitas or catnips. This is a big one with a tiny bee. And um, then there's the sort of weedy one that grows all over that if you want to let something take over, it will do that. Uh, and your cats will be in heaven. And then blanket flowers, the galardias. So the yellow one is the more native one and the cultivars tend to be more and more red, but it doesn't seem to throw the bees off at all because you can see there's all kinds of things over here. And this is from a, an orchard pollinator strip. And those are probably Osmia, I think. I don't know. Whoops. Ah, sorry. Coreopsis is another one. Uh, look at the bottom on this bee. It is stuffed to the gills. So you can see why they hold their abdomens up. Megachiles or the first megachilies, whichever. Um, they were uh, the first bees I learned outside of bumblebees because they hold their abdomens up to keep that powder out of the, from getting knocked loose, I suspect. And then these are our agapostomin males, which have yellow and black bottoms. They tend to look like little wasps flying around until they land and you can see the beautiful green. Our, Joe, is our native one this red? Or is no, it no, um, the native one has very little red and it's almost no red. Um, so like and if you are interested in growing that, it's really easy to grow. Just go along the banks of the Columbia and the Columbia Gorge and you probably find some seeds right now just about wow. anywhere you go find find like a, a washed out area of the shore of the columbia and it should be growing on there cool if you see yeah. more shore growing with little yellow plants 
there's um, a macropus I'm trying to find, and it's on Lysimachia ciliata, which come, Jane Abel told me comes up when the water goes down in the river. I think the wild ones are kind of taller and wispier than our. Yeah, they they have like they, yeah they have a kind of uh, um, they they form a really clumpy rosette, um, that's dense, and then they stick like this wispy, uh, stem up, which is really nice to pair it with, um, some more bunchier plants, in your garden because then it sort of emerges out of the plants mysteriously just pops into bloom because there's this wispy stem that doesn't have much to it and then suddenly you know it's all these yellow it's things. blooming yeah so it's nice to work into like meadow plantings and all it's fairly drought tolerant even though it grows on the banks of rivers so if you have a grassy area that might be lovely and then um just to throw out that monarchs have been labeled as endangered um this is the speciosa version there is a honeybee down here and one of the things that you can see a lot of times is these legs get trapped because they have pollinia, which is a pollen um, purse that sticks to the pollinators. And sometimes the pollinators lose a leg or they just die because they can't get away. So it's a vicious, vicious kind of a interaction sometimes. Um, it, it needs a little more water, even though it's a gray and silvery plant, you'd think it wouldn't, but you see it growing along the rivers and the ditches over here at least. Um, and then the tropical milkweeds, if you want to read about that, tropical milkweeds don't die back. I don't know if they, did, can they grow on the west side of the state? Does anybody know? I want to throw that out. I, I don't know if we can grow the, the milkweeds. There is a milkweed that grows out here, but we don't get monarchs on this side. Ah, yeah. so the tropical milkweeds don't die back and they have this thing called OE that's unpronounceable and it if the plant doesn't die back, the bacteria doesn't die. And so down south, they're killing the monarchs to get all shriveled up and awful. So it's a really bad thing. So you want stuff that dies in the winter down there, especially. And I don't think it matters up here because it probably dies in the winter. And then there are other things on milkweed. They're really cool. I love these little shrimp colored beetles, milkweed beetles. And this is a milkweed bug. And then that color means I'm poisonous because when you eat the plant, you end up like a flamingo, you turn pink and um, monarchs turn orange. So I don't know what that is, but that's a warning coloration so that you won't eat them. And the thin leafed milkweed I was reading is not as strong in whatever the poisonous chemicals are that gets passed on. So they will not be as um, toxic of a, of a butterfly or beetle as the ones on speciosa. So um, back when we were, I didn't really talk a lot about our oligolectic bees, but certain bees need certain plants like the astragaly. And I don't know what this little bee is, but it's a monardella. Um, just think about how much we've paved or plowed up that they can't access anymore. And can we make room to put a few more species in? Um, are just different things that are, affected by that? Do we want diversity? Do we want more genetics? The less there are, the less the population can respond um, well to things like climate change. Uh, do we want cross-pollination? That's really important in fruit trees and uh, getting cherries and apples and things like that. So some bees just prefer an entire group. Melisodes, I see them a lot in Gallardia because I don't have any sunflowers. Um, we have now figured out that um, at least on my side of the of the state, the little yellow, uh, early, early Melisodes are Melisodes agilis. And I didn't put their name in here for some reason. I put the Melisodes rivulus and Joe has those too. Is this the right one, Joe? They're so pretty. Oh yeah, um, you know, um, no. No, it's different. Oh, uh, it, uh -oh. that bee looks, um, like it, its back is just way more tan. Um, and that's the one on rabbit brush, right? Yeah. So, so this is, yeah, this is I'm thinking in, I have the, the thistly, the big have, monstrous you have yours on thistles. Okay. thistle bee and only on thistle. Yeah. Yeah. And I've seen that one on rabbit brush in September. Yeah. Um, the east side. Yep. It's a late bee. I don't see a lot of them. And somebody in iNaturalist named it wrong. 
<laughs> mm. Diadasia are definitely mallow bees. This is where the diadasias are. You can tell they're big and fuzzy and not little green bees. Thank you, Will. And this one is just rolling. They do the same thing as the bumblebees in the poppies. They go around and around and around and around and around. And this bee is completely coated in pollen. And the little they'll sleep in these little parts. You'll see them uh, just snuggled in there late in the day. Or if it's hot and they're tired, <laughs> whatever. Uh, so Ferelsi coccinia is our widest growing, whoops, our widest growing uh, uh, orange globe mallow. And down in, they should, they should nest close to the globe mallows. Down in Richland, there's little turrets, they're called turret bees. And uh, dad and his son found him and I wrote him a note to say, can we talk about this? And, and he never wrote me back. Um, but Jane and, and I think, Donna Lucas have found those same turrets, but I haven't seen any in my yard yet. They're here somewhere because they obviously come back. They had trouble this year because the mallow bloomed differently from when the bees came out. So that's one of the problems with climate change. If you're a specific bee and you need a specific flower and your flower doesn't bloom for three weeks till after you, you're gone, what are you gonna eat? And what are your babies gonna eat? And so I've been curious about if they would live on uh, Rosa Sharon or hollyhocks I found some honey bees. Is, is mallow a different version of, of uh, poppy? Because that there's looks a mallow like poppy. There's a globe. Yeah, it's, there's a purple one that looks like a poppy. There, I think they're different kinds of plants. Yeah, I, the only re the reason why I asked that question is because we, I mean, it, we had a plant that looked like that. And mm. we had the problem that, I mean, it, it looked like it had a lot of pollen on it, and I saw no bees visiting it. Huh, that's interesting. So, I, yeah, I, I'm not, and you know, so I'm always curious to see, you know, I wonder why. I mean, that's, that's mm -hmm. a very pertinent question, I guess. <laughs> yeah, if you're trying to feed your bees and nobody's using it, you might want to get a different plant. But if it's right. really pretty, you might want to live with it. If it's the only one, it's not a big deal. A whole field of them might be different. Um, so hollyhocks are these are all in the mallow family, malva, something or other, but mostly Rosa Sharon's hibiscus, and it comes from Turkey and Southeast Asia. Iliamna rivularis, which is this one, grows in my yard, and it grows in the mountains and by rivers and streams, so it's called stream bank or river mallow or mountain mallow, and mine is like five feet across, and I can whack it back, and it'll kind of put out another set of blooms after the diadasia are done. And then the Malva parviflora is that little one that lays on the ground. It has little bitty flowers called cheeseweed because of the way that the seeds form and all of them kind of form seeds like in little wedges. So we used to eat those when I was a kid. A couple of native nurseries that I know about, this is the Metau. Um, the interpretive center is on that side. And then this guy that does most of the native garden lives right next door and he has the nursery. So you can see the plants all growing up and then maybe go over to the nursery. The, the other thing I forgot to say, and Chris, I had, a, I had a quote from Chris, but I can't see it. So I forgot to say it. Go to your gardens that have native plants or just have plants that have insects on them and look for the ones that make the bees the happiest, the ones that they're all over. Um, then you can find out what will grow in your area because if the garden's next to your house, or not far away, it'll probably be fairly similar. And then this is some Derby Canyon natives. They live up in um, by Dryden, Pishaston, just down the hill from Leavenworth. And it's surrounded by pear orchards. And when Ted was running the pear, his pear orchard, it was all organic and the people that bought it stopped doing that. So I definitely saw a decrease in bees in the garden. Um, there's some penstemon there, there's some yarrow. Um, he grows cactus, this is a cactus, and he's got a pollinator habitat sign, which when it gets kind of weedy and dry and ratty, it's good to remind people that it was really pretty in the spring, and please have some patience and tolerance when it's growing some new flowers. And then we learned thick, thick oh, I can't remember the word. Um, that's Joe's finger making the, the pollen in the cactus move. So if you put your finger or a bee in the cactus, the Anthers will curl around the bee. I don't know if that's true for all cactus. Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. It's really cool. Wow. <laughs> so, look, look. I'm sorry. Maybe you want to stick your finger in like every cactus flower after that. Um, mm -hmm. the, the the little um 
anthers they have a little mind of their own <laughs> like they can move they it's, it's yes yeah, it's, it's cool <laughs> yeah so and um, oops. lisa i'm yeah. gonna interrupt you though heidi has been giving us lots of good information in the background in our chat oh and um do we need to stop we're at the end yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna, but like also, <laughs> she used the word thigmotropic. Maybe Thank you, that's the word, yes. <laughs> I wanna say thick so, and that's I think what cornstarch does. Um, we'll, we'll go through it after you're done and we'll go I'm back. I'm pretty much it. done. Um, so just, I had some pictures from the Metal Pollinator Garden because Don and I did a thing up there and this is not a bee, can you tell? It's a very good bumblebee mimic. It's a fly. See how it doesn't have any antenna? And its legs are skinny, especially this part right here, down at the bottom where bees tend to have pollen carrying. And then this is a wasp that's a vegetarian. So this is a pollen wasp and they come in Phacelia and Penstemon brands. Um, and they look like yellow jackets, but you can see they have these little knobs. This is probably a boy. They have really wide antenna and they hold them out like that at the edges. And they have these funny little clubs on the end. But they'll be inside the penstemon or on the phacelia, and that's it. Very cool. Called Pseudomaceris vespoides, and I can't remember the other one, Edwardsy maybe. So these are just some of the plants there. It tends to look kind of just green, but then you get down and you find all these wonderful little things. So look at this diadasia just dancing in the pollen. And some information, and thanks for coming, and let's see that chat. I have to unshare, right?